My goodness, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is for you, I hope you are having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler, this is Strong Opinion Sports. Today is Wednesday, April 4th. Whew, oh my goodness, two big stories really just popped out to me today. It is not Robert Griffin III. I don't know why everybody feels this need to talk about RG3. RG3 is a backup. Can we... I, He's not newsworthy. He signed a one-year contract with the, the Ravens. Whoa, big whoop. It's not a big deal. I, I'm not going to really talk about RG3 today. I just don't care. It's not big news. I got to ask, is it me or is it football? Because in my opinion, football always, always seems to have the most compelling stories. And I just want to know, is that because the NFL is special or is that because I have a personal preference towards football? I, I don't know. Because it feels like, to me, the NFL just is geared towards better storytelling. Like, right now, if you look at the NBA, it seems like there's only four people. James Harden, Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, and whoever's playing for the Warriors that night. It's like, oh, I don't understand. I mean, the NFL next season, I care about, like, 28 of the 32 teams. And even the bottom four teams are interesting to me because of quarterbacks and this and that. I just, man. Again, I ask, is it me? Is it personal preference? Do I just love football more, or is it actually true that the NFL lends itself better to compelling storytelling? I don't know, but I, I would love you to answer that in the comments. I'm really curious. The big story right now, the biggest story in all of the NFL is this, and, and I might, fair warning right now, I may go very deep into like some kind of conspiracy theory with this topic. I apologize. I wrote a lot about it. I went nuts. Uh, and, and I hope you guys enjoy. I really don't know. I might just sound like a lunatic. If I do, slap me on the wrist and say I'll see you on Friday. <laughs> I want to talk about this. Wide receiver Brandon Cooks has been traded from the New England Patriots to the LA Rams. The Rams are going to get Brandon Cooks and the Patriots' fourth round draft pick. And the Patriots on the other side of the trade are receiving the Rams' first round pick, which is the 23rd overall pick and they also get the Rams sixth round pick so again the Rams get Brandon Cooks and a fourth round pick the Patriots get a first round pick and a sixth round pick remember Brandon Cooks had 65 catches seven touchdowns and over 1,000 yards receiving last season and my initial reaction to this trade I, I'm, I'm reading on my phone my initial reaction was what in the world are the Patriots doing I, I simply did not understand when I heard I was like they traded away Brandon Cooks a great receiver a deep threat what why would they do that here's a stat for you five guys from the Patriots starting roster from the Super Bowl are all gone Deion Lewis the running back is gone Brandon Cooks receiver Danny Amendola two receivers gone Nate Solder the left tackle from the Super Bowl is gone and Cameron Fleming the right tackle from the Super Bowl is gone. Five starters from the Super Bowl, all gone. Both tackles, two receivers, and a running back. Well, yikes. Like, I mean, I'm at home. Like, what? I, I, I like the Patriots. I d generally kind of root for them. I'm like, what are they doing? What in the world is going on? I have a key phrase for you. I've said it before. I will say it again. If you are a Patriots fan, do you trust Bill Belichick, you need to ask yourself that question. Do you believe in Bill Belichick? There is something I admire about Bill Belichick. I, I admire his this quality because it's something I could never do. I could Bill Belichick does something, and you know, I'm even uncomfortable using the word admire. I don't know that I admire it as much as I respect Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick does something I could simply never do. It's almost like a villain trait. Bill Belichick is different from you and me. You and I, you and I, me talking, you listening, you and I see coworkers and see them differently than Bill Belichick would. When I look at my buddy Katsu, I see a guy who can edit videos. He's a hard worker. I worked with him for years. I laughed with him. I remember going to see movies with him. When you and I look at someone else, we see their strengths. We see their weaknesses. We see memories. We have emotions about them. When Bill Belichick looks at another person, he sees a number. Bill Belichick is different from you and me. 
and what I respect about Bill Belichick, something I could never do with other people, something I could never do. Bill Belichick takes his emotions out of his relationships with people. Bill Belichick sees his employees as assets. So I ask you again, do you trust Bill Belichick? Because in 2009, Randy Moss had 83 catches, 1,264 yards, and 13 touchdowns. The very next season, Randy Moss was traded away to Minnesota. Or in 2012, Wes Welker had 118 catches, 1,354 yards, six touchdowns, and the Patriots let Wes Welker walk away into the sunset. The Patriots, if you remember, they let Vince Wilfork go. All-time great Patriot, Vince Wilfork. They let him walk away because they did not want to pay him $7.5 million. There's Garrett Blunt. There is receiver. There's guy after guy after guy. We have seen a rich history, a maybe not rich history, a, a deep history of the Patriots trading away players and letting players go. <clears throat> and that is because Bill Belichick removes his emotions from decision making. So let's try to look at things the way that Bill Belichick probably does. Bill Belichick traded away Brandon Cooks for, sorry, Bill Belichick last year traded away his first-round pick to the Saints, and the Saints gave him Brandon Cooks. Bill Belichick traded a first-round pick for Brandon Cooks, and now he's traded Brandon Cooks for another first-round pick. It's a wash. And now what Bill Belichick has is three big assets. Bill Belichick has two first-round draft picks and Rob Gronkowski. And, and honestly, I'll tell you this. I have no idea. I, I have no idea what in the world Bill Belichick is doing. It confuses me. It baffles me. Bill Belichick is much smarter than I am very clearly because I don't, I don't understand. I can't follow him. But I can speculate. I can formulate, okay, maybe this is what Bill Belichick is doing. I can speculate. And there's a question worth asking. Are the Patriots still trying to win a Super Bowl with Tom Brady? Do the Patriots want to try to win another Super Bowl with Tom Brady? Are they done with Tom Brady or are they going to keep it going? Because Tom Brady is 40 years old and the Patriots moves last season reflected that. Last year, similar to what the Rams are doing now, the Patriots went all out. They said, we're going to go after everybody we can. We're going to go and win another Super Bowl. I think this, if the Patriots have decided they have given up on trying to win another Super Bowl with Tom Brady, if the Patriots have given up on Tom Brady, I would trade Rob Gronkowski. I would enter a rebuilding phase. And and I do believe Bill Belichick does want to win a Super Bowl without Tom Brady. He wants to prove I'm more valuable than Tom Brady. I think that matters to Bill Belichick. But I don't think that's going to happen. I do not believe The Patriots are done with Tom Brady. Here's my speculation for what will happen in the future of the Patriots. Because I don't think the Patriots gave up on Tom Brady. If the Patriots had given up on Tom Brady, they would have kept Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy Garoppolo, that was it right there. That was the decision. They're going to ride Tom Brady until that car can't move anymore. They are going to ride Tom Brady into the ground. So, I believe the Patriots are going to hold on to Rob Gronkowski and they're going to use the draft picks they have to find themselves a left tackle. I looked at Bleacher Report. Bleacher Report ranked the 45 top tackles in the NFL last year. These are the, of the guys who took snaps at left tackle last year, these are the top 45. I'm not going to read them all in order. Obviously, of course not. But I do believe The Patriots may use their two first round draft picks to get a left tackle. Now, here's the deal with that. A team in contention, a team that has a chance to make the playoffs is not going to part ways with their left tackle. And coincidentally, very shockingly, of course, pretty much every team that's any good has a top left tackle. Hmm. 
So there's not a lot of options. It's not it's not real good for the Patriots. Now, there are a few options, and this this part is where it may get kind of conspiracy theorist. Who would be willing to trade a left tackle for two first round picks? Because again, left tackles are huge. Left tackles are incredibly desirable. Who is willing to part ways with a left tackle? A team that needs something else. So the Ravens have a good left tackle, but nah, that doesn't feel right. I don't believe the Jets are going to part ways with their left tackle. They have the third overall pick. But there are three teams that could make sense to trade with the Patriots to give them a left tackle. Maybe the Patriots trade their two picks to the Seahawks and take Dwayne Brown. I mean, Maybe. I mean, the Seahawks are rebuilding, but I think this is highly doubtful because right now the biggest flaw the Seattle Seahawks have is they do not have an offensive line. Why would you compound the problem and make it even worse? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, maybe the Patriots trade two picks with the Buccaneers and acquire Donovan Smith. Donovan Smith is 24 years old, and I believe if I'm the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, a team that's trying to build a winning culture, trading away your 24-year-old young left tackle, that's a completely counterproductive move. I don't think the Buccaneers are going to make a trade with the Patriots. They could. The Buccaneers could move DeMar Dotson over from right tackle to left tackle. It's possible. But I, I think the Seahawks are out. I think the Buccaneers are out. And there's not a lot of options left. Here's one that could work. Because now we're left with the Arizona Cardinals. Remember how important a left tackle is? What's the one thing more important than a left tackle? It goes hand in hand. The one position more important than a left tackle, you can argue, is quarterback. Maybe it's quarterback, defensive end, left tackle, but one of those three, you got to have them to win games. Right now, the Cardinals don't have a franchise quarterback. They don't have a future quarterback option. So right now, the Cardinals have DJ Humphreys. He switched to left tackle last season. He's had knee issues, but in five starts... In DJ Humphreys, five starts at left tackle for the Arizona Cardinals. He did not give up a sack. He's a diamond in the rough. And again, all the top tackles on all the teams, all the top tackles in the NFL are on good teams that are competing for the playoffs. The Cardinals need a quarterback. I know I'm deep in the weeds, but I think it's possible that the Patriots trade one or two of their first round draft picks with the Cardinals for the left tackle, DJ Humphreys. I think that's entirely possible. So the Cardinals can get up to three first-round draft picks and then trade up to get a quarterback. Now the Giants, they're not moving from the number two overall pick. I don't think they are. However, if the Cardinals were to offer the Giants, hey, we have three first-round draft picks. Okay, fine. The Giants are like, we have Eli Manning. We're gonna, we'll take your draft picks and we're going to build ourselves an amazing franchise. So I believe it's very possible. Because I, I, don't, I don't think the Patriots are done. I don't think, I do not, here's what I don't think happens. I do not believe the Patriots hold on to their draft picks and draft two first round picks. I, I don't think it happens. I think they are not done making trades. I believe what is going to happen. The succession plan for Tom Brady... The future of the New England Patriots at the quarterback position is either quarterback Logan Woodside or quarterback Luke Falk. They're going to draft one of those two quarterbacks late in the NFL draft, and that is the future. The point of all of this is to say, I do not know what Bill Belichick's plan is, but I do not think he is done. I don't think Bill Belichick is trying to sabotage the Patriots. People are speculating that. That seems silly and ridiculous. Bill Belichick's legacy is connected to the success of the New England Patriots. And if Tom Brady plays badly and Bill Belichick loses, that reflects poorly on Bill Belichick. He's not trying to sabotage anybody. And I do know this. Running back is replaceable. The NFL draft this year is a running back heavy draft. And the Patriots use multiple running backs anyways. Deion Lewis, they'll be okay. Receivers are replaceable for the Patriots. 
The Patriots won. Tom Brady won a ton with Troy Brown at wide receiver. Troy Brown is, no offense to Troy Brown, he's nobody. The Patriots are going to be okay. See, running back, replaceable. Receivers, replaceable. They're going to make a move to get a left tackle. That is what I believe the Patriots will do. And the Patriots are going to be okay. As a guy who kind of, I, I admire the Patriots, I respect them. I trust Bill Belichick. I believe that the Patriots are going to be fine. I don't believe Bill Belichick is make, done making moves. I think there's a lot more to be done for the Patriots and their offseason moves. I'm excited to watch what happens. I don't know what they're going to do, but I do not believe the Patriots are done making moves. Jesus, man, that was a long, long opener. I am sorry. We have a great show today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the Brandon Cooks trade affects the Rams. We talk about the 49ers today. I believe if you are a 49ers fan, you are glad that Brandon Cooks went to the Rams. I'll explain that later. We're going to talk about Johnny Manziel, a little bit of NBA, a little bit of basketball. I don't know if we're going to talk about NBA. We're going to talk about basketball. How about that? You can subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube, as well as my best, most interesting clips. All right, I want to go here next. I do this thing called, I do this thing called an Instagram story. What that is, is a bunch of clips and highlights from my day. I put them on my Instagram. They appear for 24 hours and they go away. My whole idea behind this is I hate how fake social media is. It's kind of my protest to, it's my protest against how fake everybody is. I try to share very honestly, very authentically. And I share almost everything on my Instagram story. I share good moments. I share bad moments. I'm very proud about how on, honest and authentic I've been. I really hope if you're listening, if, you're, if you watch my Instagram story ever, you can tell I'm just being myself. I'm not trying to hide anything. But that does not mean that I share everything. I saw a sketch comedy once. It's about a guy named Honest Abe, a, a rip on the president. He said, you know, Honest Abe never lies. But Honest Abe would blurt out things he thought. He'd be like, you look fat in that dress or your cooking sucks. They were all true. He wasn't lying, but they were things that were unwanted. So I share almost everything on my Instagram story. Almost everything, but not everything. I leave out my sex life because you can overshare. I don't talk about that. You can overshare. That is what Johnny Manziel has been doing. I don't talk about my sex life on my Instagram story, and Johnny Manziel should take notes. There are some things Johnny Manziel should not talk about. So after the San Diego Pro Day, he was honest, very authentic. He said, Johnny Manziel said he would be doing well for a couple of months, and then he would fall off the wagon. And wow. Johnny Manziel just went on the Dan Patrick show, and he opened his mouth again, and he overshared. Johnny Manziel said that if the Browns had done their homework, then the Browns would have known that he did not have a good enough work ethic. Johnny Manziel said that if the Browns had done their homework, the Browns would have known that Johnny Manziel was not ready to run a pro-style offense. He'd never done it in college. He was not ready. You know, here's the thing about Johnny Manziel that I think is really important. I called my dad today. I was on my way to a meeting. It's about 20 minutes from where I, where I live in Pullman, Washington to get to Moscow, Idaho. And I called my dad. I explained the situation with Johnny Manziel. I explained what Johnny Mel, Manziel had said on the show. And uh, I got my dad's opinion. Mind you, my dad works in the business world. He's a consultant. He helps young businesses get off their feet. He works with a lot of young people who have dreams. And my dad's problem with Johnny Manziel's statement was Johnny Manziel is taking the blame off himself and putting it on the Browns. He's blaming the Browns. The Browns should have known that it was he wasn't ready. He doesn't say I, Johnny Manziel, wasn't ready. He says the Browns should have known that I wasn't ready. That is a lack of taking responsibility. Johnny Manziel isn't saying I'm the one to blame. He's inadvertently blaming the Browns. And I think that's the biggest problem with this statement of Johnny Manziel. He overshared. He, he got caught up saying too much, but he also said the wrong thing. And if he just kept his mouth shut, I don't know. 
But I do not want my NFL quarterback to say things like that. And yet the problem is that's exactly what Johnny Manziel has to say. (sighs) It's a problem because Johnny Manziel bottomed out. He embarrassed himself. He really put himself in in a hole. And the only way for Johnny Manziel to reclaim his name was to be open and honest. But the concerns you have for Johnny Manziel are not the concerns you should have for a backup in the NFL. A backup quarterback needs to be reliable and should not be a distraction. Johnny Manziel, love him, hate him, whatever you want. Johnny Manziel is a distraction. He doesn't mean to be. He doesn't want to be. But Johnny Manziel is a distraction. And it's becoming more and more clear that Johnny Manziel needs to just go play football in Canada. He's a Canadian football quarterback. Go prove yourself. There are two things that Johnny Manziel needs to prove. He needs to prove he can be a stable grown-up. And Johnny Manziel, also a little small factor about all of this, Johnny Manziel needs to prove he can actually play football. Sorry, he can actually play football at a pro level. Because I, we, we saw him run around at Texas A&M. That's great. But can you sit in the pocket? Can you read a defense? Do you understand X's and O's? We don't know about we don't know that yet. I like Johnny Manziel, but until he proves himself and really kind of calms the storm around him, the comeback, all this stuff, it's it's too much noise. He's not going to be in the NFL. Once Johnny Manziel proves he can be a grown up and play football, then he can come play in the NFL. But until then, he's going to be a great ticket seller for the CFL. I'm excited. I'll watch Johnny Manziel's highlights from Canada. That sounds fun and exciting. And I don't think he belongs anywhere on an NFL roster. So the Rams traded a first round draft pick for receiver Brandon Cooks. And I love it. Oh, I love it. Such a good trade for them. The Rams, they now have a deep threat. And the push for the Rams Super Bowl continues. They are on a mission. They're doing everything they can. The Rams are aggressive. The Rams are going All out. And if I'm a 49ers fan, I love it. If I'm a 49ers fan, this is exactly what I want the Rams to do. Does it hurt the 49ers next year? Yes, it does. The Rams could win a Super Bowl. But then what's going to happen? See, the Rams made all of these short-term bets. And eventually, the bubble's going to burst. It's all going to explode. Do you know what a Super Bowl hangover is? So, so they're already, they're going to have a Super Bowl hangover, but forget a Super Bowl hangover for a minute. Think about this. The Rams have a ton of stars with one year deals left on their contract. The Rams have a bunch of guys that have contracts coming up very soon. And the Rams said, screw the future. We don't care. We're going all out on next season. And I think that's exactly right. If I'm the Rams, they're doing the right thing because the Rams and any team, really, if you have an option, if you have an opportunity, if you have a chance to win a Super Bowl, you take that shot. You do everything in your power. The Rams have a brief window. They're hitting it as hard as they can. And when the window closes, it's going to be messy afterwards. So three years from now, this is what the Rams are going to have to deal with. Not even three years. Next year, Marcus Peters' contract is up at the end of next season. And the point of this is the Rams' whole roster is going to look entirely different in three years. So Marcus Peters' contract is up after just one season. And Dominic and Sue only signed a one-year deal at the end of his next season. And Dominic and Sue will be a free agent. The Rams are going to have to pay Brandon Cooks if they want him to stay. He's got one year left on his contract. Aqib Tlaib's contract only has two years left. Aaron Donald, maybe the best defensive lineman in all of football, will be an unrestricted free agent at the end of next season. And Todd Gurley has two years until he is an unrestricted free agent. Oh, and by the way, so you're going to lose Marcus Peters, Namak and Sue, Brandon Cooks, Aqib Tlaib, Aaron Donald, Todd Gurley. Some of those guys are going to have to leave. You're going to have to pick and choose financially which ones of those guys you want to 
be in bed with. You're going to have to pick and choose, guys, because eventually they're going to be too expensive to keep them all. And that's coming next year and the year after. And then, man, you're done. So d don't mind all of that. Don't forget. <laughs> Here's the kicker. You're going to have to pay Jared Goff. Jared Goff's contract is, he's on his rookie deal right now. He's making around $7 million a year. You're going to have to pay your franchise quarterback, Jared Goff. And what, what does a franchise quarterback go for right now? I mean, I think Jimmy Garoppolo played five games, got $137 million. It's like, what, $30 million a year for Jared Goff? Oh, and then if, if Jared Goff wins a Super Bowl, he's going to be more. Remember what happened to Joe Flacco? Yeah, if you're a 49ers fan, what you want? You want the Rams to win the Super Bowl next year. Because that balloon's going to pop. The more success the Rams have next year, the more expensive all of their pieces are going to be. If the Rams win a Super Bowl, the 49ers hit the lottery. Because they're going to have to pay Indomitian Sue money. Brandon Cooks, Akeem Tlaib, Aaron Donald, Todd Gurley, Marcus Peters. Oh, and again, by the way, if they win a Super Bowl... Jared Goff's price goes up. So the Rams, Rams are like fireworks. They're going to burn really bright, very briefly, and then be gone. And the Rams had better capitalize on their window. They better win now, because when it's done, when the window's gone, the Rams are going to come crashing down. Because when you have to pay everybody in two years, Rams are done. If I'm a 49er fan, I am rooting for the Rams to be successful now so their implosion is even greater in two years. All right, I'm going to take a short break. My name is Zach Schumler. Uh Remember, you can subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube as well as my best, most interesting clips. If you like Strong Opinion Sports, help me grow this channel by telling your friends about it. All right, I'm going to go to a meeting. It's awkward and weird. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pause. When I come back, I may look different. I'll probably wear the same shirt. My hair might be messed up or something. I don't know. But I, this podcast is going to have to go out late, probably after midnight tonight. I'm sorry. I, it's late. It's 830. I have to leave for a meeting. It's the life of a college kid. I apologize. I will be right back. And when I come back, I'll look a little different. But podcast is going to go. We have one, two. We're going to talk about... 49ers and Raiders possibly meeting in the Super Bowl. We're going to talk about the Raiders cutting their punter, why they did that. I'll tell you guys about a 36-year-old man who played hockey. And I don't care about hockey a lick. I don't, I don't care at all. And yet this hockey story was like, what? What happened? So that'll be fun. I'll tell you guys about that. And at the end of the show, I'm going to make one last case about basketball that you're going to find interesting before you never care about basketball, at least college basketball, again for the rest of the year. My name is Zach Schaumler. I will be right back. There is a topic I keep getting asked to talk about. It's funny. It's, it's could the 49ers and the Raiders meet in the Super Bowl? I mean, the short answer is yes, right? The short answer is, of course, the 49ers and the Raiders could eventually do it. But the key to that answer is not next year. The 49ers are not ready for the Super Bowl, and neither are the Raiders. The 49ers and the Raiders both went 6-10. and 10. Literally, the two franchises had to flip a coin to see who got the ninth overall pick. I mean, these guys are neck and neck. They're in the same exact spot. The 49ers and the Raiders are in the same place as franchises. Neither team is a total rebuild, but neither team is ready just yet for a Super Bowl. Both Franchises have franchise quarterbacks, and I think eventually superstar quarterbacks. I think Derek Carr, without a doubt, Derek Carr is a superstar, and so is Jimmy Garoppolo. They both have the look. They're both attractive guys that are going to be on ads someday. And they both have premier coaches. Kyle Shanahan, the coach of the 49ers, is one of the young faces of the league. John, John Gruden is legendary. John Gruden's a premier coach in the league 100%. Superstar quarterbacks, premier coaches. The 49ers and the Raiders will both be contenders for a Super Bowl in two to three years. Now, in 2019, the Super Bowl is in Atlanta. Neither team is going to be there. The Rams or the Raiders aren't going to be in the Super Bowl, and the 49ers are not going to be in the Super Bowl. I would like that, 
but they're not there yet. But in 2020 and 2021, the Super Bowl is going to be in Florida both years. And in 2022, the Super Bowl is going to be in LA. It is very possible we could see the 49ers and the Raiders match up in the Super Bowl in Florida or Los Angeles. Because in two to three years, both of these teams will be ready to match up and play in the Super Bowl. All right. I have, I have two more things. I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I, I got DM'd last night. Someone asked me, he, he's a Raiders fan. A Raiders fan DM'd me on Instagram. It's my favorite social media platform. He asked me why the Raiders cut their punter, Marquette King. Marquette King's a great punter. He's like maybe a top four punter in the league. And, and you can argue though, even though Marquette King was a great punter, you can argue that a punter is maybe the most replaceable position in all of football. Of all the starters on an NFL football team, a punter is the most replaceable. I mean, nobody on a football team is replaceable, right? None, nobody on a football roster is like, yeah, let's just get rid of him. But a punter is the closest thing to replaceable on an NFL roster. I want you to Google Marquette King. Things you find when you Google Marquette King that come up. These things are things like eccentric personality. Marquette King doesn't care what you think. Popular internet punter. Marquette King is never going to be normal. Those are all the things that come up when you Google his name. I believe that what John Gruden said was, who on our roster is loud? Who's loud in this building? And then John Gruden said, of all the loud guys on this roster, who is replaceable? Find that guy and cut him. And they cut Marquette King. The Raiders cut their punter Marquette King because he was loud, he was a distraction, and he was replaceable. And John Gruden doesn't have anything personal against Marquette King. Here's the thing. John Gruden is taking control of the Raiders' locker room. It's that simple. It's that simple. He's not going to cut Marshawn Lynch. He's not going to cut anybody else. John Gruden was simply cutting Marquette King to make a statement, to send a message. I'm in control of this franchise. I'm in charge. Do as I say or leave. And there will be no screwing around. John Gruden cut Marquette King to make a statement. Remember, you can subscribe to this channel. Share with your friends. Help me out. All right. We have, we have two stories left. I think this story is really cool. It's a, it's one you're going to want to bail out of. Please don't. It's short. I'll get to the point, but I think it's, it's interesting because it relates to you and it relates to me. Did you grow up wanting to play major league sports? My dream growing up was to play in the NFL. And one guy, one guy actually did it. You know what's really cool? A 36-year-old accountant... A guy like you and me, a regular dude, a 36-year-old accountant, played goalie for the Chicago Black Sox Hawks the other day, and he completely dominated. Last Thursday on March 29th, the Chicago Blackhawks had two goalies <clears throat> go down with injuries. They had to leave for the day. So the third string goalie was starting for the Blackhawks, which meant that the Blackhawks had to call a reserve backup, Scott Foster. He played hockey in college, but his career ended in 2006. See, normally when your goalie gets hurt, you bring up a guy from minor leagues. If you can't do that, you have a guy in your city, a regular dude, not on the roster, an emergency goaltender to come show up and help out. And that is what Scott Foster is. Scott Foster signed with the Blackhawks for one day. He was an emergency backup, and normally an emergency backup as an emergency backup, Scott Foster said he watched 12 to 15 games over the course of his life from a box, ready to go, just in case. But even when he was watching from a box, he was the fourth string guy, just in case. See, as an emergency backup, you never get into the game. I mean, he's, he's involved with the team, but he never plays. So for some perspective, from what I can tell, an emergency goalie has only gotten into a game once and the emergency goalie, he was a, it was like a, an equipment manager, played for seven seconds. The longest an emergency goalie has ever played in an NHL game was seven seconds. Scott Foster, 
the 36-year-old accountant played for 14 and a half minutes, and he stopped all seven shots that were shot at him. He did not give up a goal, and his team, the Chicago Blackhawks, won 6-2. to two. Hell yeah, that is a score for guys like you and me, guys that dreamed of playing someday in the major leagues. Scott Foster lived the dream. I don't care about the NHL, although I will say I like live hockey games. This is just silly and ridiculous and such a cool story. I had to share it on the podcast. <clears throat> okay, we have, I guess we have two things left. We still have Jim Mora, and we're going to talk about college basketball. The last time you'll ever care about college basketball till next March. Everybody is talking about Jim Mora and what Jim Mora said about his former college quarterback, Josh Rosen. Jim Mora is the former head coach at UCLA. The entire time Jim Mora was at UCLA, and I don't know about the entire time, but the entire time Josh Rosen was at UCLA, Jim Mora was his head coach. I played quarterback. I wanted to share my two cents. What if this was my coach? So what did Jim Mora say about Josh Rosen? I wanted to find the clip. I could not. Remember Josh Rosen is the former quarterback from UCLA. Jim Mora recruited him to UCLA, and the entire time Josh Rosen was at UCLA, Jim Mora was his head coach. So Jim Mora was fired from UCLA. He's trying broadcasting. And the other day, Jim Mora said on TV that the USC quarterback, Sam Darnold, should be the number one overall pick rather than his former quarterback, Josh Rosen. And this got everybody angry. Everybody flipped out. Couldn't believe it. How could he be so unloyal? (sighs) And what Jim Morris said was that Sam Darnold was a better fit in Cleveland than Josh Rosen. And Jim Morris was attacked for these comments. By the way, he also called Josh Rosen a millennial, said he was a better fit, and said he needed to be challenged. But he did say Josh Rosen was the number one quarterback in this year's draft. Now, when he was attacked, he backpedaled. He said even more. He did say Josh Rosen is the best player, not quarterback, best player overall in this year's NFL draft. I did not like anybody attacking him. I thought it was ridiculous and annoying. I believe the media is making a whole lot of something out of a whole lot of nothing. Making a mountain out of a molehill. Making a way bigger deal out of it than it actually is. First of all, he was attacked for not declaring his former quarterback to be the best. Because coaches are supposed to say their former players are the best player ever. Like Dabo Sweeney, Clemson's coach, says Deshaun Watson is the Michael Jordan of his era. He's the biggest thing since French toast and whiskey. Whatever, I don't don't know. No. Coaches often oversell players. Unlike most coaches, Jim Mora was honest. That's great. And I have a couple takeaways from that. First of all, Jim Mora is right. Jim Mora is honest and he's correct. Because Sam Darnold is, absolutely Sam Darnold is a better fit in Cleveland. Cleveland's highly dysfunctional. I I like Cleveland. I'm rooting for them. If you're a Browns fan, don't take offense to that. But it's true. The Browns are dysfunctional. Sam Darnold will make the best of a bad situation, just like he did at USC. In Cleveland, Josh Rosen would not make the best. Josh Rosen would make all the dysfunction public. He would point it out. He would call people out. He would implode the organization because Josh Rosen, like him, but he's a smart aleck. Josh Rosen is a smart aleck with high expectations. He would not put up with Cleveland. Remember, I know a lot about Josh Rosen. He was the same graduating class as I was. I know a lot about the kid. He's a smart aleck. My second thought is, so why didn't Jim Mora oversell Josh Rosen? Simple. Jim Mora wants to be a broadcaster. If Jim Mora wanted to be a coach, he would have oversold Josh Rosen, but he doesn't want to. He wants to broadcast. 
Jim Mora wanted to be a coach again. He would have said Josh Rosen is the best quarterback. He's the second coming of Tom Brady. So that that way, when Jim Mora was coaching again, and he went and met in the living room of an 18-year-old high school quarterback recruit's house, he could say, I always back up my quarterbacks. I always defend my guys. I always support my guys. Now, the third point is this. Jim Mora might have actually been trying to help Josh Rosen. Why are we always out to find the negative? Why are we looking for bad in people? Why can't we look for the good in people? Something I do. I, I, I think it's really important. Is it possible that Jim Morrow was just trying to help his former quarterback? Because I know a guy who's a big USC fan. He loves Sam Darnold. He does not want Sam Darnold to go to USC. Because he thinks Cleveland is going to ruin any quarterback that goes there's career. He thinks if Sam Darnold goes to Cleveland, it will ruin his career. And maybe Jim Mora feels the same way about Josh Rosen. Maybe Jim Mora feels like he's protecting Josh Rosen from ruining his career in Cleveland. Browns fans, no, I mean no offense. You know that nobody wants the Browns to succeed more than I do. But maybe Jim Mora just thinks the Browns are a mess and he doesn't want his friend and quarterback to go to Cleveland. Maybe Jim Mora feels like he's helping Josh Rosen. But what I hate the most is all of this fake outrage. Why is everybody offended on behalf of Josh Rosen? It's Josh Rosen's problem. If he's offended, great. But it's not your job to be offended for Josh Rosen. Josh Rosen's an adult. If Josh Rosen cannot handle the truth, you can't handle the truth. I said it terribly because I'm quiet. I don't want to make everybody up. It's past midnight. If Josh Rosen cannot handle the truth, he should not be an NFL quarterback. And Jim Mora, all Jim Mora said was the truth. I support Jim Mora. Jim Mora, if he was my former coach, I wouldn't have been angry. I would have said, yeah, coach, you're telling the truth. Because it's all about fit. If I, If my high school coach or my former college coach said that about me, or maybe my former boss said, yeah, Zach shouldn't do that job. He's a better fit for this other one. I'm not angry. I'd ask why, sure, but I wouldn't care. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be offended. I completely support what Jim Mora said. I believe Jim Mora did nothing wrong. Lay off, relax, stop looking for the bad in everybody. It's what I hate about the media right now. The media is always trying to find the negative. Everybody's supposed to be some villain somehow. Relax. Lay off. Drives me nuts. Okay. This is the last day of the year I can talk about this, so I'm going to take advantage. I'm going to do it right now. Because I am not convinced that one and duns are the best way to win an NCAA college basketball national championship. I do not think it's the way. Look at Michigan. Look at Villanova. The national championship was won with experience, defense, and coaching. It was not won with NBA players. I mean, maybe Jalen Brunson, but Jalen Brunson was not a one and done. Duke is going to challenge my theory. Again, my theory is that one and duns cannot win national championships anymore. They had a brief window, but I don't believe they can do it anymore. Now, next year, Duke is going to challenge my belief. I'm actually, for the first time in my life, excited to watch regular season college basketball because Duke has the top three recruits from high school next year and the number nine recruit. Duke has R.J. Barrett, Cameron Reddish, and Zion Williamson in order, the one, two, and number three recruits in the nation. Plus... Duke has the number nine recruit in the nation who is the number one rated point guard, Trey Jones. That's four or five star recruits, four one and duns, possibly three, but probably four. And my question is can a team completely made of one and duns, can a team like that, a team full of 18 year olds who are going to play in the NBA, can a team like that? win a national championship because if Duke cannot win a national championship next year no 
buddy can. Duke basketball absolutely has my attention next season. I'm interested. I'm invested. I'm curious. Is my theory true? I know Anthony Davis did. I know it's happened before, but not recently. I don't know. I don't believe that a team made up of one and done 18-year-old kids, I don't believe a team like that can win a national championship. Now, Duke is going to absolutely challenge my opinion. I'm very curious. I'm very excited. Normally, I don't care about college basketball, especially not regular season college basketball, but Duke absolutely has my attention. My name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for listening. I hope you had a great day. I don't know if this podcast was great. I have no idea. I know I had kind of an interesting take, if nonetheless, on the Patriots. Look, my goal is not to be right. My goal is to make you think and be interesting. I really hope I was able to do that with this episode. I'm sorry it's late. I had a meeting that went four hours instead of three. I have a production, a live show up to do later in the month. I had to go prep for that. (sighs) But uh, I've already started prepping for Friday's show. It's going to be really good. I'm excited. Friday show should be out earlier because I have a lot to do on Saturday. I can't put that back at all. My name is Zach Schaumler. I'm very excited. Remember, you can subscribe to Strong Opinion Sports on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. You can find the full entire hour-long podcast on YouTube as well as my best, most interesting clips. Tell your friends about Strong Opinion Sports if you like this podcast as much as I do. Tell your friends on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, whatever it is. Help me grow this podcast by telling your friends about it. My name is Zach Schaumler. I hope you have a great one. But I'm bummed. Bam, we're done.